time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A presentation of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, maker of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world-honored Longines. Good evening. This is Frank Knight. May I introduce our co-editors for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope. Mr. William Bradford Huey, editor of the American Mercury, and Mr. Elliot Haynes, associate editor of United Nations World. Our distinguished guest for this evening is the Honorable W. Averill Harriman, director of the Mutual Security Agency. The opinions expressed are necessarily those of the speakers. Mr. Harriman, since you're a distinguished American and a candidate for the presidency, I'm sure that our viewers will appreciate your views on a number of subjects tonight. Now, sir, is it true, uh, since we have had all of the other candidates except uh, General Eisenhower, we'd like to place you in the political spectrum first. Is it true to say that uh, you are the most liberal or the most ardent supporter of the new and fair deals? I believe I am. Uh, both uh, the most liberal and the most ardent supporter of uh, all of the principles, uh, and I've substated the, in detail. In using the, the, the terms right and left, which are a bit confusing, you perhaps are further over on the left. Well, I don't recognize those terms. <coughs> those, are, those are continental terms and, uh, and relate to a spectrum of, uh, of political thought which doesn't exist in this but country, in, in my in judgment. The, in defining but in terms of liberalism and conservatism or reactionaryism, Progressivism. I put myself well, on Mr. the liberal Herman, progressive side. What is, uh, what are the basic policies of the New Deal? Would you say? Well, the basic policy I think that President Roosevelt brought to this country was that we should build our economy uh, from um, uh, the lower income groups up, and not uh, have it trickle down from the from the top as it as it used to. And and it's worked that way, you know. Uh, our uh, the income of the low income group has has increased twice as fast as those of the of the higher Would you attribute group. that to uh, government policy, government action? I think it uh, a great deal had to do with government policy, establishing minimum wages, uh, social security, uh, of course strengthening, uh, helping the unions um, uh, organize and uh, developing appropriate collective bargaining. Now the president has said that he... There are many other aspects, but those are fundamental. The president has said, sir, that uh, he thinks that uh, one of the issues is Trumanism in this campaign. Are you willing to accept that as, uh, and to accept Well, I use the words the New Deal and the Fair Deal because they, they are um, over a period of 20 years and I've been involved with them. I've, I've worked for President Truman, great respect for him. I think he's one of our great presidents. Uh, been very forceful and forthright and uh, both on domestic front and also on international affairs. He's had great courage. That's an, a very interesting evaluation we've had in the year that We've had our program. We've had, of course, people with all sorts of views about the president. Your evaluation is that President Truman is, is a truly great man. Yes, and a great I think president. he's faced uh, some of the most difficult problems in the international front that uh, any president ever has. In the uh, beginning with uh, uh, the uh, beginning, really in '46, when the Russians were moving into Iran and, and uh, Greece and Turkey, when they were threatening and attacking the Marshall Plan, the North Atlantic Treaty, facing up to Korea. There's a long list, and he's a man of great decision and, and uh, great foresight. You think history will be, will be kind to him and will call I him a great president? Mr. Kind. Herman, uh, to get down Not to Not kind to him, but a uh, great, great appreciation of, uh, of his judgment and character. To get down to a specific question in domestic politics, uh, some people think that the uh, people who have very firm mm. opinions on civil rights want all or nothing at all and hold us up from getting anything. What do you think about that? Well, I don't uh, th look at it quite that way. I think we, we have got to move forward. Uh, the Democratic Party has always moved forward, and I think we've got to move forward with this uh, issue. I think Congress has got a responsibility to pass effective legislation. You know, the executive branch can do a great deal. I've worked in the executive branch. President Truman's done much, but there's much more can be done. And if one shows the example of, um, of elimination uh, of discrimination, uh, one can do a lot. And By moving forward, you mean a compulsory uh, fair employment practice? Well, there's a great deal of emphasis on that word compulsory. When, as you know, um, there are compulsions uh, in the proposal for FEPC, but the main weight of it 
uh, is to uh, for education and mediation mm -hmm. and to bring things along voluntarily. I think those that consistently use this word compulsion uh, uh, wave a red flag rather than uh, emphasize mm -hmm. the parts of FEPC which are really cooperative and uh, uh, can lead to uh, uh, action uh, voluntarily. Mr. Harriman, during your long and distinct... By that, I, don't want, I, I want to say that I think there must be some law back of it in order to get the attention that it, that it needs. In your long and distinguished Possibly. career with the government, sir, it's been often said that uh, you were a Republican. Uh, yes, I was. Were, were you a Republican in 1932? Or did no, you go I was the born government? and raised a Republican. Uh, New York State Republican. I was a Republican in 1928. I knew Al Smith. And I was on the Park Commission, worked with him, admired him. And then I was very much afraid that the uh, policies of the Republican Party would get us into trouble. Abroad, I saw us turn our backs. I thought Wilson's ideas were, were right. And in 28, I thought we were going to bring the world down on top of us because uh, we were lending money abroad and building up tariffs. So, so when did you see 1928, I voted Democratic, and I've never been happier since. I feel I'm part of the uh, generation that I'm living in. I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not among those so, that are so trying to obstruct progress. So, so the, the press has not been correct in identifying you as a Republican since 1932, as a Republican in the Roosevelt and Truman No, I was a Democrat in 28. And Al Smith, Al Smith, Democrat. You say that, uh, you just said that tariffs were one of the reasons you became a Democrat. The Republicans were enforcing. Well, I say at that time we were, we were encouraging yes loans abroad and uh, building up tariffs at the same time. Well, now we're doing more or less the same thing now, and recently you called people that wanted tariffs five percenters, I believe, uh, meaning I suppose that it hurts the country in some way. Would you explain well, that? Well, I think what uh, that wasn't very well reported. It was rather a complicated thing. Uh, you see, many of the, uh, the groups that are coming down, or representative groups coming down, are objecting to uh, as small as five percent of their total market in this country oh, being 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 taken by the by foreigner. Now, my own judgment is that uh, they will, our country will prosper at least five percent, and they'll get at least five percent more business in the United States than what they lose. Uh, That's uh, just an example of bad market. newspaper reporting. Then. Well, I wouldn't say that. It was a rather a complicated uh, statement to make, I uh, and uh, I don't blame the reporting. Uh, Mr. Harriman, it, it's been said... And great but I did call them the five percenters who, who objected to the five percent. <coughs> a great <coughs> many people believe that the most unpleasant fact in our world today is the fact that the Russian, Russian power complex is very strong. Yes. And that is the most unpleasant fact in America. That is the great today. danger that isn't only unpleasant. We are living in a very dangerous uh, time. Now, do you yeah, think, think we'll do. Is, it if, is it fair to say that the Roosevelt or Truman administrations at any time aided and abetted the growth of Soviet power? Well, uh, th what is uh, fair to say, uh, during the war, I was, I was representative of President Roosevelt uh, in all of our negotiations with the Russians. Uh, we uh, tried to help the Russians stay in the war. And people forget today that when we landed on Normandy, there were some 200 Russian divisions uh, German divisions on the Russian front, plus 50 satellite divisions. We never could have gotten ashore if those divisions hadn't been uh, fighting uh, desperately on the other side. Now, our objective was to keep them in the war. And um, as such, we did help them, and we kept them in the war. Now, nothing that was done in the war helped their post-war. Uh, this idea that Yalta was a sellout is just not true at all. Uh, why would the Russians go into such tremendous lengths to break them if they'd been so favorable to them. You Did know. you attend all of the great conferences? I, I attended uh, all of the conferences during the war except one of the two Quebec conferences. And, and was anything done at any of those conferences that you did not approve of? Oh, of course. I didn't uh, agree with everything, and I'm not saying that everything that was done was, uh, uh, was entirely right. I've, I've always stated that naturally we made, made mistakes, but I think the basic idea that we should try to make arrangements with the Russians to live in peace was absolutely essential for us to do. And Not the a fact that that failed um, showed the, the world that uh, we were trying for peace and the Russians had worked fault. If it hadn't been for that attempt, uh, uh, many people in the world wouldn't uh, would think that we and not the Russians were the trouble. Well, Mr. Herman, uh, many people think that Russia doesn't want a total war. I agree And yet that. you do agree, but yes. that in preparing for it, as we seem to be doing now, we may scare them into it. No, I don't think that's true. I think that we've got to get ourselves uh, 
uh, in a defensive position. We can't live uh, exposed, and uh, none of our friends and allies, you, you, you can't have confidence in the world if uh, uh, one is afraid that any minute uh, there may be a, a major, major attack. I'm sure, now, sir. Our, our policies, of course, are entirely defensive. We are not building a big enough mm -hmm. establishment. I'm sure, sir, that our viewers would like just a word about your, your political plans from this point on. Mm -hmm. Do you plan to be active during the month of June? Well, I'm planning to uh, go around to the different states, uh, particularly those uh, that uh, where there are un uninstructed delegations, and I've been very much surprised and gratified by the support I've received where I've gone. Uh, I've been abroad so much that uh, many people haven't seen me in recent years. Mr. Herman, in uh, your travel around the country, you may bump into General Eisenhower one of these days, and uh, of course he's expressed admiration for you in his book, and you say that you admire him. Uh, are you running against him because you think he's going to be caught by the isolationists in his party? Well, uh, I have tremendous respect for General Eisenhower, a warm friend. He's been a great patriot and a great soldier. But uh, when he embraced the doctrines of the Republican Party, why, well, I'm opposed to him politically, and uh, I told him so and uh, when I saw him uh, before. Now, I think it's a, the, that you can't have a forward-looking foreign policy and a look-back policy here at home. I also think he's going to be a prisoner of the old guard. Uh, mm -hmm. And as a final observation, sir, do you... Do I you think we need a democratic administration, frankly. Well, thank you very much for being with us tonight, sir. Yeah. The editorial board for this edition of the Longines Chronoscope was Mr. William Bradford Huey and Mr. Elliot Haynes. Our distinguished guest was the Honorable W. Averill Harriman, Director of the Mutual Security Agency. Twenty-five years ago, on May 21st, 1927, the world was electrified by the news that the Lone Eagle, Colonel Charles Lindbergh, had sent his monoplane, the Spirit of St. Louis, down at Le Bourget Field in France, completing the first non-stop flight from the United States to Europe. Sensation was to follow sensation. A few days later, Admiral Byrd landed his three-motor plane on the French coast. Clarence Chamberlain flew non-stop in a Belanca Mollum plane from the United States to Germany. Harold Yancey flew from Old Orchard, Maine to Spain. Cost and Volant spanned the Atlantic westward from France to New York. Thus, in a few short years, Daring men set the stage for the worldwide air transport system of today. Longines is proud that practically every one of the great pioneer aviators of history used Longines watches for the essential navigation on which life or death might very well depend. The compelling reason for the choice of Longines watches by these great aviators is the same which today appeals so strongly to you and to me the greater accuracy of a Longines, the reliability of a Longines, the trustworthiness of a Longines. That is why, for any gift occasion, no other name on a watch means so much as Longines, the world's most honored watch, premier product of the Longines Whitnor Watch Company, since 1866, maker of watches of the highest character. We invite you to join us every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday evening at this same time for the Longines Chronoscope, a television journal of the important issues of the hour, broadcast on behalf of Longines, the world's most honored watch, and Whitnor, distinguished companion to the world's honored Longines. This is Frank Knight, reminding you that Longines and Whitnor watches are sold and serviced from coast to coast by more than 4,000 leading jewelers who proudly display this emblem Agency for Longines with Norwatch. This is the CBS Television Network.